Climate change is a global issue, but for many Indigenous communities here in Ontario, it's acutely local as well. In the search for ways to mitigate its effects, a new initiative is reaching for the stars. Well, it's reaching out to NASA anyway, the American Space Agency, in a collaboration that draws on Indigenous knowledge and geospatial data to find answers. Melanie Goodchild leads the project. She is the Senior Indigenous Research Fellow and Ambassador at the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience at the U of W, and she joins us now. I want to call you Ambassador, is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Ambassador Goodchild, that's got a good yeah, ring to it. It's got a nice ring. Yeah. Thank you for coming in tonight. I want okay. to, just before we jump into our discussion, give people a sense about what you're up to. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you say we throw a clip to this uh, piece here, and then we'll come back and chat. Okay. Okay, this is from Waterloo's profile video on Ambassador Goodchild. Sheldon, go. <laughs> Some Mi'kmaq elders uh, came up with this theoretical framework, and it's called two-eyed seeing. So one eye sees with an Anishinaabe or an Indigenous perspective, and the other eye sees with the other kind of Western thinking or science. The satellite imagery has a lot to offer our communities, and we will bring our knowledge and, and our needs to that data. Okay, I think we get Western science, we understand what that is, but Indigenous knowledge is not something everybody will understand. So let's start there. How do you define that? Okay, so Indigenous knowledge, well, there's great diversity amongst Indigenous communities. I'm Anishinaabe, for instance, and so we would say Anishinaabe and Damawin and Gik and Dasawin. So it's our worldview, it's our way of seeing the world, and it's really interconnected with um, local ecosystems. and. Some people have called it traditional ecological knowledge, but it's actually also the contemporary knowledge, the, the lived experience of Indigenous peoples, which is in some ways an alternative to Western theory and scientific thinking. Well, I was just going to ask, is that, is that dramatically different from what people would learn in any typical Ontario college or university? I think it's dramatically different in the way it's presented, where knowledge resides, like we, we have an oral history, we present things through storytelling. But there's a lot of common ground. I mean, our elders say, we've always done science. It's just not been called that. And so in university, we tend to think of the scientific method. Uh, and, and storytelling is not part of the scientific method. So there's, there's a bit of a false dichotomy there, though, I think, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of common ground, because we're really just looking for answers and looking for ways to make good decisions about protecting the Earth. If you don't call it science, what do you call it? We call it, uh, there's actually a word that we say, it's, it's our relationship to the land. In the Anishinaabe Mawin, it's Gidakimanan. And in, in what that means, we say land is a key, which is uh, a, a, a fast moving current. And so our ancestors knew that the earth was round and not hmm. flat. And so a key is land. And then Gidakimanan is your relationship to all of creation. So we don't actually have a word for nature or environment or science in our language. Let's pursue that a bit. The, okay. the, the differences in language between mm -hmm. the way indigenous culture describes things and the way Western science does. Right. Give us some examples. So our, our language encodes our way of looking at the world. And a, and a good example of that is in English, we have a lot of nouns, right? A table, a glass, a tree, and those become inanimate objects. But in Anishinaabe, it's all descriptive. And so we would describe things. And in that, we're creating energy. So things are alive. That's where that concept of Mother Earth comes from in the spirit of water. Water protectors talk about the spirit of water and that you need to protect that spirit. And it's because we believe that those are a gift and that we need to have a reciprocal relationship with those gifts and appreciate them instead of looking at them purely as ecological services. Does that, in fact, change the way you problem solve compared to Western scientists? I think it does, because we have a holistic view. And so often, science is compartmentalized. I mean, there's lots of different types of scientists, right? And so that, whether you're a biologist or a botanist or ecologist, and even science comes together in something new, like ecological economics. But we have a holistic view, recognizing the web of life and interconnectivity of all of uh, creation, including our sacred responsibility within it. So when we're problem solving, we're not just looking at compartmentalized knowledge, we're looking at the whole ecosystem, for example. Yeah. So when Inuit elders in the Arctic were asked about uh, declining beluga whale populations, they started talking about beavers in a recent study. Mm -hmm. And it was because the, beaver, the beavers were building dams and affecting the food sources, and then the population of the beluga whales went down. But science would be perhaps just looking at specific aspects of the issue, whereas the elders talked about, 
hey, there's a lot of beavers and they're building a lot of dams. <laughs> so they were able to bring together their local traditional knowledge with the knowledge of scientists who were monitoring those populations. You know in science that they say that people are either left brain people or right brain people, right? right? You know, humanities are right side, science, math, left side and so on. Right. Does that notion or does that theory exist in indigenous knowledge as well? It does, but it's actually not necessarily a binary division. We have a, a more holistic uh, teaching, a framework that uh, is, it's actually represented in the medicine wheel, so the four colors, and there's four quadrants. So our elders talk about four intelligences. Uh, similar, I guess, to you know, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences. Uh, this is uh, emotional, emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical. And so when you're problem solving and you're looking at you know, really complex issues. You're thinking about those different perspectives, but often in society we tend to intellectualize everything. All right, let's cut to the chase here. You, yes. you have an extraordinary new partnership with NASA. Right. The American Space Agency. Yes. How did that come together? Yeah, when, when people hear that, they go, NASA, NASA? And I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, NASA, NASA. Uh, I was actually in uh, International Women's Forum Fellowship Program sponsored by Harvard Business School and INSEAD. And one of my co-fellows was Dr. Nancy Searby, who's the program manager for NASA's Earth Sciences Applied Science uh, Capacity Building Program. And we were talking about indigenous knowledge systems and we were talking about spirituality. And she said, well, they've reached out to communities in, in, in the United States to talk about geospatial data and the applications for remote sensing with indigenous communities. And we decided that we'd like to work together and it's taken about a year to come together and you know, figure out what we're doing. So in a couple of weeks, we're bringing together indigenous knowledge keepers with some of the federal government departments uh, that support NASA and some of the NASA scientists to talk about this kind of intersection of traditional knowledge and, and their technologies. I could be totally wrong about this, okay? Mm -hmm. This may be just my, my bias and stereotype um, coming to the fore here. Mm -hmm. But don't scientists think they know everything about everything? Yeah. And why would, they, why would they think anything as spiritual as what you could bring to the party right. uh, would be something that they'd want to consider? Yeah, I think what's happened is that uh, in my experience, uh, and, and I'm a social scientist and I've worked with a lot of, uh, with, with what we call hard scientists or normal scientists in the Thomas Kuhn sense. And there's a scientific method and there's, there's a real um, division of labor in terms of the disciplines. And there's an opening now, I think, for looking at other world views because we need a more complete picture of really complex problems. So if you think of something like uh, climate change or biodiversity loss, those are very complex issues. They're not simple or complicated. In other words, there's not one sector or one world view that's gonna solve something so interconnected to other things. And they're looking at traditional knowledge and what that can bring to what's really, uh, a somewhat important, of course, but narrow view of a problem. And they're recognizing that, you know, if you take a satellite image and you look at, uh, you say, the water distribution, that bringing in elders and local knowledge keepers who even would describe that image in a different language mm -hmm. can provide insights. So it's all about increasing your exposure to different types of data. Which scientists actually like to do. Yes, they okay. do. Okay. Can I ask you to take your right arm and go like that? Yes. Okay, can we get a camera on this? Uh, I was about to say that the planets are near and dear to your heart, but yes. it's actually <clears throat> not on your left arm, it's on your right arm. Yeah. You've got, and just twist it a little more that way, yes. That way? Mm -hmm. I, that's Saturn, right? Yes. That's Saturn. What is Saturn doing on your right forearm? Yeah, so, <laughs> so I have the planets, and it's interesting, because when we introduce ourselves, I say bonjour and dinner wa mag and a duk, those are my spirit names, and both of them have the word star in them. Uh, one of them in, in English is morning star, and my spirit helpers are two orcas, and these represent one of our teachings from the elders, and so I decided to get that inked onto my forearm. When? Uh, a couple of years ago, I got this. Yeah, so it was actually before I was working with NASA. I was going to say, I, I'm guessing that's one of the first things yeah. you showed them when yeah. you met them. <laughs> I did show them that. Yeah. I mean, people usually admire the, the ink that I have, so uh, they did <laughs> see that, yeah. That's cool. What kind of work are you going to be doing with NASA as it relates specifically to climate change? So the geospatial data um, offers uh, real-time satellite imagery so that you can look at land use planning, uh, climate change adaptation, mitigation, 
you can look at water use, uh, disaster risk reduction. And so it's looking at the, the needs of indigenous communities and the sort of the gaps in data that indigenous communities have. Because the while the software is open source, the the actual interpretation of the images requires some training. And so we're going to be meeting with Native American communities on the Red Cliff Reservation. Where's that? Uh, that's in Wisconsin. Okay. So I'm heading there in a couple of weeks, and we're going to be talking to them about their needs. And so, for example, the Navajo Nation looks at uh, water and has drought issues. And so hydrologists work with NASA. Navajo hydrologists work with NASA. Another example here is uh, in the north, you know, caribou, migration, uh, reindeer herders uh, up in the Arctic have worked with NASA and brought together their their understanding of permafrost thaw and different things that are happening because they're experiencing global temperature rising twice as fast as we are in the south. And so they're having to look at adaptation strategies, uh, particularly because that's their, their food source and, and a really huge part of their culture are you know reindeer or caribou herders, mm -hmm. for example. What kind of, if any, pushback have you had from sort of official science to what you're trying to achieve here? Yeah, I think if if you're challenging the status quo, uh, you're bound to, to receive some pushback. And often it, it happens at uh, more of a personal level than an institutional level when you challenge the identity and core of a scientist who's not used to speaking about spirituality, spirit helpers, mm. metaphysical things. Uh, indigenous communities, for example, had a lot of knowledge that came from cosmology. And that's reflected in the fact we have 13 moons and we don't call the months like January, February. We name them by what's happening in the seasons. Mm. And so uh, scientists often are, are finding that they're not the only experts in the room. And so sometimes that's, uh, I think it's a little bit of discomfort. It's destabilizing, you know, when your core identity is, is something that uh, it's not necessarily being challenged, but it certainly uh, requires some humility to understand there are multiple worldviews and viewpoints. You are introducing some rather new ideas for, for the folks on this one. Yeah, for sure. But at the end of the day, I presume that you think we'll be better for the collaboration. And I wonder what that looks like. Yeah, so you know, there's there was a, a push, I think, in, in ecology to integrate these knowledges. And I don't really think it's about integration. I think it's actually about what we call ethical space. Uh, Willie Ermine talked about ethical space. If, if you and I are sitting here talking about really distinct worldviews, the space in between us needs to be safe, fair, where I don't put down your ideas and you don't put down mine. But we have this discussion, and we actually try to integrate them. So it's actually about maybe braiding sweetgrass. It's about braiding these ideas together and going back and forth, recognizing that they're both equally valid and have something to contribute. And they're going to give us a more holistic picture. If you just completely ignore you know, one, either science or traditional indigenous knowledge, that you would not get a complete picture. And therefore, the, the, you know, what you're trying to do, make decisions or find solutions to problems, you're going to miss the opportunity because those insights might be in that other worldview. So give us a concrete example of how the bringing together of these two different ways of doing things would result in something positive. So I think, uh, you know, if you look at the, the remote satellite imagery and, and the caribou um, or the reindeer herders, as an example, because this was an actual example of NASA working with uh, Sami reindeer herders, is that they are dependent on reindeer for their, their food and their sustenance. And now with global, ch you know, climate change, the snow, when you have a, you know, the late, like we just had an ice storm here, mm -hmm. right? This, this late rainfall, that, that really kind of affects dramatically what happens with the reindeer because there's a tough layer of snow that they can't get through to eat and then their reindeer would starve. And so what NASA has done is gotten together with these knowledge holders and said, now what can we do to make changes so that we understand weather patterns and uh, it, it's the same thing with flooding, forest fires, and so there's real-time data, but it's complemented by an oral history that goes further back than the scientists have data on. Hmm. There's the, it's in songs, it's in ceremonies, it's in legends. Uh, there's stories of the tsunami that, that happened on the west coast of Canada, for example, in the Coast Salish people's oral history that the scientists are only sort of figuring out. And so you often see that. You'll see stories of elders have been saying this for a long time, and then scientists caught up and found evidence, and now they come together to tell a more complete story. How long ago was that tsunami? That tsunami was in about 1700. 
from what I understand. So your oral traditions know more about that than what scientists have left on record from them. Right, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let's, oh, I'm just curious. Do you, do you start with a smudge ceremony when you get together? We do. I introduce a ceremonial practice. And when I say bonjour in dinner while mag and duck, what I'm saying is hello, all my relations. And, and even just in a, in a teaching of how you recognize territory, how you do a ceremony, uh, teaches quite a bit to people who've never experienced that before. Hmm. Let's show this, uh, Sheldon, show this animation if we can. This is a NASA animation showing climate change time lapse. This is from the year 1880 to almost present day to last year. Yellow, orange, red, signifying, of course, a rise in temperatures. And I wonder how climate change has, in your experience, been affecting indigenous communities in your world. Mm -hmm. So when you see temperatures rise like that, one of the, the effects of that are the melting of glaciers uh, in the Arctic. Right. And then where that water goes is into the sea, and then you have sea levels rising. So there are indigenous communities that are uh, internationally and as well as in Canada have seen severe weather events. They've seen hurricanes coming further north, uh, major tides coming into their communities um, from the sea. Also, permafrost thaw, and so you're seeing insects come further north than they've, than they've done before, changing migration patterns. Uh, so people who are living really close to local ecological systems, they're fishing and they're hunting, are seeing the effect this has on the ecosystem of which they're in, you know, a part, and also culturally and spiritually a part of that system. Now, besides your work with NASA and that work on climate change, are there other issues that you are working on that you think the injection of indigenous knowledge would help? Yeah, for sure. So I have the opportunity to work across a lot of different sectors because I study social innovation, complexity theory, and systems thinking, which really to me is Anishinaabe in Damawin. It's, it's all the same thing with our knowledge. Uh, because we were uh, systems thinkers uh, before we were, you know, before we heard that term, systems thinkers. So I've done some work with the Jay's Care Foundation on suicide prevention. I've, I do work on food sustainability, food waste in the GTA, the food lab here. I support work at the Banff Center on reconciliation. Uh, and I'm also working with, uh, or last year I worked with the Toronto Arts Council, looking at systems thinking. And so it's applicable across many different uh, areas of interest because people are recognizing how complex things are. And what system, systematic thinking does is it helps you understand paradoxical implications. Like you think you know the answer, but you haven't thought about the, how it's gonna cascade across multiple systems. What's the, what's the one thing, if I could say to you, Ambassador, you got one thing you could really make a fantastic improvement in this world on by bringing these two different worlds and cultures together, what would mm -hmm. it be? Um, I think it would be the concept of open dialogue and recognizing that when we label something, uh, it's easy to dismiss it, right? Something's right wing, left wing, and, and, and it shuts down conversation. And there's space in Canada now, maybe through the, I think through the TRC, through the UN Declaration, and other international documents that have encouraged us to open space. And that's, that's what I would share with people, that you know, we need to have dialogues across cultures and dialogues of honest and open communication and recognizing that we need safe spaces to do that so that we can be vulnerable, because some people will feel very vulnerable, um, especially if we start talking about privilege and start talking about racism and, and really big issues that are affecting our society, um, misogyny, all of those things require safe spaces. And indigenous, um, even indigenous like circles, sharing circles, and. Things like that are opportunities for people to understand a different way of doing business, business as usual, uh, is, is very different in our communities. And uh, the people that I've brought home to uh, my community to experience ceremonies, for example, uh, it's changed their life. It's a transformative mm. experience. And I would personally love to see more people have that opportunity. Greater mutual understanding would be a wonderful yeah. thing yeah. everywhere in the world, wouldn't yes, it? Yes, it would. I wish you well. That's Thank Melanie you. Goodchild, Senior Indigenous Research Fellow and Ambassador yes. at the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.